Um, there's some key pro positions which you'll be practicing today in your practical sessions, but it's also a good habit to get into um, to look at all eight key probe uh, positions on the chest. There's four on each side. And in what we're looking at, if you delineate the chest as far as the sternum, the anterior axillary line, and the posterior axillary line, you divide up the chest into four areas on each side. And you want to look at a, a representative area in each segment so that you can feel like you've had a good overall picture of what's going on with the chest. This patient is lying down. Most of the patients you'll see in the hospital are lying down. Um, that we ultrasound, although it is possible to image the, the back. And what, we are, what we're teaching you today is primarily we focus on the anterior because there are some, um, there's gravity and essentially if you're on your back for any length of time, any kind of fluid in your lungs will go to the back and you'll get false positives. So we really want to image the front and the sides to, to tell us uh, what, what is going on in the lung. Anteriorly is the best place to look for a pneumothorax, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But if you think about it, if you're supine and you have air that has escaped from inside the lung into the pleural space, where is it going to be if you're on your back? It's going to be anterior, right? Um, and posterior laterally, we can best see effusions, which is fluid that's in the pleural space, and consolidations, which are you know, pneumonias or atelectasis of the lung, posteriorly because those are gravity dependent. All zones, though, you can appreciate pulmonary edema. Um, pulmonary edema, in, in very rare circumstances, will be unilaterally, but in most cases, this is due to congestive heart failure or um, a non cardiogenic pulmonary edema. It's going to be bilateral. And so you should be, when you're trying to identify pulmonary edema, being able to see it in multiple fields. Very briefly, the probe selection, you know, ideally we use the curvilinear probe, but it depends on your patient's body habitus. You can use the um, high frequency linear probe and you can also use the cardiac probe. Um, a lot of it depends on whether you're looking for the forest or the trees. If you're going to look for the big picture, you start with the low frequency probe that gives you a deeper view. And then when you're looking for the detail, like we do when we um, look at pneumothorax, then you pick up the high frequency probe and you get more detail. So you'll see examples of both of that. A couple quick tips, and this, um, this is important for any kind of imaging, is if you don't have a great picture, if you don't see anything, basically you have to think about well, what you know, troubleshoot. Do you have enough gel? You know, air is your enemy, gel is your friend. You've probably heard that a thousand times, but it's, it is absolutely true. If you don't have gel or you don't have good contact with the chest wall or if you've got something obstructing in the way, you have a bandage or a bra strap or something like that, you need to clear those things so that you can see. You may need to reposition the patient. Um, and you also have to consider is the reason you can't see anything is because there's air in the tissues or air in the thorax, like a pneumothorax, and it's obliterating your image, and that tells you something too. So looking at the uh, overall picture is important. Very quickly, I'm going to review lung anatomy. I know you've all had this on histological and gross levels, but uh, the lung is divided, and we're really interested in what's at the periphery of the lung. The terminal bronchioles branch into the alveoli. These are divided off from each other in interlobular septi. Um, and so if you look at that histologically, this is a normal lung. You see the terminal bronchiole and all of the little alveolar sacs off the end. This is what it appears like in pulmonary edema. So you can see that the air is replaced by fluid. You'll also notice that the interstitium in the picture of pulmonary edema is quite a bit thicker than the interstitium in, an, in a normal lung, and that's going to be important uh, to, to note. Um, looking back at the picture, the pleural line of, it is also sometimes referred to, you'll hear it referred to as the VPPI, which is a visceral parietal pleural interface. It basically just means where the visceral and the parietal pleura come together and they, they move on each other. So these terminal um, bronchioles go all the way out to the periphery of the lungs, and the interlobular septa come up to the surface in a perpendicular fashion. That is important also to note, because it will explain some of the artifacts we see in a moment. Also, most, of the peop most people, these interlobular septa are about seven millimeters apart. It's not key that you understand, you remember that number per se, but just approximate in your head about how far these, these uh, structures are apart. So now that you remember what the lung looks like, and we've talked about which probe to use, what you're really interested in is when you're looking at someone's lung, is it normal or not? And the way that we ascertain that is to look, at, look for some artifacts that, that are classic in certain situations. One is A lines and one is B lines. And of course, you're asking them what are A lines and what are B lines, and we're, we're going to explain all that. 
A lines are horizontal artifacts. They're repetitive, they're from reverberation due to ultrasound waves that have gotten trapped at the pleural line. So anytime you have uh, two things next to each other, two substances or tissues next to each other that have a really different acoustic impedance, for instance, floral line and air right next to it, you're gonna have, that sets up a reverberation at that interface. The air, the ultrasound waves get trapped right there and they reverberate back and forth. And what happens is the probe reads that as a deeper structure. You can see A lines in normal lungs or in pneumothorax because A just means air. It doesn't tell you where the air is, it just tells you there's air. The air could be in the lung in a normal situation or it could be outside the lung in the pneumothorax. So to show you what we're looking at here, this is the chest wall. This is obviously a um, high frequency probe. This is the chest wall. And then you have the ribs, the cortex of the ribs are bright white. The pleural line or visceral parietal pleural interface is just below, usually about a half centimeter below the ribs, depending on the patient's body habitus. And then down here you have this A line, which is just, and I'll take it away so you can see it. Do you see that reflection of the pleural line deeper? That's artifact, that's not really there. It's, it's a fact that ultrasound waves have gotten trapped in that bright white um, pleural line that has very different acoustic impedance than the air right underneath it. And it sets up a resonance back and forth and occasionally that resonance reaches, goes back to the probe and the probe sees, well, the signal took a little while longer to get back, so there must be something deeper that's creating that signal. So you will see these repetitive horizontal artifacts, and I'll give you some more examples. You'll also notice that the, um, the, the A-lines are spaced equidistant from the space from the chest wall down to the VPPI is, is the spacing that you'll see. And if you take the a probe or increase the depth, you'll see that that spacing remains consistent throughout. Okay. <clears throat> Another example, just a reminder, the air is just not a good transducer, uh, transducer of sound. The, the sound will reach that pleural line there and it will just, most of it will scatter back. But the ones that do reach back to the probe in an organized fashion will create an image and that's the pleural line. However, some of those uh, sound waves reach the pleural line and they get stuck in the pleural line and they reverberate and they reach back to the probe later and it ends up in interpreting that as lines that are lower. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. It's just an artifact. Your, line, your lungs are not striped. There's just, this is because there's air and the, the difference between the air and the pleural line is creating this artifact. Okay. So normal lung will have A lines. Also pneumothorax will have A lines as well. So A line does not necessarily mean normal, but you will see A lines in normal lungs. Yes, you had a question? Um, does it depend on what frequency you use? Or is it just the resonance effect? It doesn't really depend on what frequency you use. You'll see this artifact because there's such a huge differ uh, difference between the acoustic impedance of the pleural line and the air next to it that there will be a resonance phenomenon with most any probe you pick. It, should, it doesn't change, it's still the same, just the depth of the line is from the chest wall to the VPPI is the, is, a, is the spacing. You'll see multiples of that as it goes down, okay? Good questions. Um, so what, when you're wondering whether you have normal lung or not, you are looking for, well, are the A lines gone? Because if the A lines are gone, then that means there's not air there, that something else has replaced the air in the lung, and that could be anything, that could be blood, uh, it could be edema, infection, contusion, tumor, any number of things can obliterate the A-lines and then you have to start thinking of what's, what has taken its place. So now we're gonna get into what are B-lines. B-lines are actually vertical artifacts that erase the A-lines. So normal aerated lung has A-lines, but if you have B-lines, these are artifacts created by fluid in the lung that will obliterate the A-lines. So normally, these vertical comet tails, you can have, you can have a couple little ones that are normal. You can have up to four, some people say three, can be normal. But if you have multiple diffuse B lines in multiple fields, then that is abnormal. That is fluid that has overtaken the air in the lung. And you remember that histology picture we just showed you with the thickened interlobular septi and the fluid in the alveoli. It could also, that, that fluid is next to the air in the lung and will create a reverberation, but the reverberation in that case is vertical and I'll explain why in just a moment. 
So here's an in motion picture of what bee lines look like. The fluid is replacing the air. It looks like a light show. But, and you'll notice that there's multiple and they go all the way to the edge of the screen and they, the A lines have disappeared. Another example, these are finer B lines and there's a physiology behind why these look a little bit different than the others, which I'll touch on. So the, the reason the B lines happen is, again, it's an artifact that you have to interpret what the artifact is because you can't actually see the lung. The sound waves are trapped in the fluid that's in the interstitium. Remember the interstitial um, walls, the interlobular septae, are about seven millimeters apart. When those get thickened with fluid, the sound waves get trapped in that interface and will create a reverberation. And the reverberation is vertical because those, those septae are vertical compared to the chest wall. They come all the way up to the chest wall perpendicularly. So as the ultrasound beam reaches that interface and creates a reverberation, it, it creates multiples of this reflection, and therefore you end up with a comet tail. You'll see two different types or, or natures of bee lines. One is the more gross appearance, where the, which is what you're seeing on the left there. Um, that is interstitial edema. Generally, that's fluid that's in the interlobular septae, but maybe not in the alveoli yet, but still it's, it's the fluid that's not normally in the lung. And those tend to be spaced about seven millimeters apart up at the chest wall. The one that on the right that looks more fine and diffuse, that's when you progress from just interstitial edema into alveolar edema or ground glass or you know, more significant um, pulmonary edema so that the fluid is actually in the alveoli and that means the alveolar are spaced only about three millimeters apart so you have a, just a kind of a diffuse B line. Appreciate the difference there? All right, so just to review uh, the key findings when you have pulmonary edema or alveolar interstitial disease, which can also be, which can be cardiogenic, non-cardiogenic, and it could be uh, fibro fibrosis. There's many things that could create this, but essentially what it is is you don't have air, you have something else in the interstitium of the lung that's replaced the air, so you, your A lines are gone. And then you have comet tails that go all the way to the edge of the screen in multiple and in multiple fields. Just a few more examples, B lines versus A lines, the horizontal versus the vertical. And just some stills of different ways that the B lines can appear. Chest X-rays, um, if you've had any radiology, you'll, you will have heard the term curly B lines. And on a chest X-ray, a curly B line is this perpendicular to the chest wall opacity that represent pulmonary edema. So you can see the B lines on ultrasound, B lines on chest x-ray, same terminology, same, describing the same thing. So when, when you later on hear somebody refer to a chest x-ray that has curly B lines, that's a marker of pulmonary edema and that's what they look like and so you can imagine why they look the way they do on ultrasound. Okay. <clears throat> we're going to move on. We'll have some time at the end for more questions about A and B lines. Um, but we're going to move on to uh, ultrasound of pneumothorax. And just a reminder about what a pneumothorax is. Normally, your lung is inflated. It's like a balloon. It's covered with the visceral pleura, and the chest wall is covered with the parietal pleura. And normally, they're adhered together, usually almost like a suction, a very thin layer of fluid between the two. And if anything, if any air gets in between those two layers, the, the lung will just collapse. You lose the suction. So a pneumothorax is when your lung has collapsed and air has, has entered the chest cavity instead. Pneumo meaning air, thorax meaning chest. So you start at the, at the midclavicular. We use the high-frequency probe again because we're looking very superficially. We're looking for the pleural line, which is only a centimeter or two underneath the surface in, in some people. You choose the high-frequency probe, you, you start in the second intercostal space. The orientation is towards the, the orientation marker is towards the head. Um, and you move downwards anteriorly and then splay laterally so that you're getting images in all four quadrants. You have to do it a little bit more laterally on the left so that you avoid the heart. What you also want to do is when you put the probe on the patient, you want to watch them breathe through a few respiratory cycles because what we're trying to pick up here is, is the pleura moving? So you have the visceral line and the parietal uh, pleura together in a normal patient, and if you're breathing, then there's motion at that interface when you breathe. 
if your lung has collapsed, there won't be any motion at that interface because the, the lung is way down here. There's three big things you're going to look for with a pneumothorax. One is the pleural line. We just talked about that. The other is lung sliding. And the last is when you, you can put an M-mode line through the pleural line, put the, put the image in M-mode and watch over several respiratory cycles what happens through that line, and you can actually see whether the lung is moving underneath due to the, an artifact that it creates in a, on the M-mode. We have several examples of that. So again, your anatomy, identify your pleural line. Remember that you have the ribs, that, which also hyperechoic um, at the cortex, and there's usually rib shadows behind the ribs. Some people call this the bat sign, so that you have the cortex of one rib and the cortex of the other rib is the wings and the pleural line is the body. You can uh, kind of see that. You're looking for that. That's what you want to see in your image. The rib on either side and the pleural line in the middle. Um, you may see A lines. If you do, does that mean you don't have pneumothorax? No, because A means air. It doesn't necessarily mean the air is inside the lung. It could be outside. You may see B lines if the patient has pulmonary edema. If you see B lines, do you think that the patient has a pneumothorax? Right. If you see B lines, the patient does not have a pneumothorax because B lines are originating from the, the interstitial edema that's from the lung. And so if you have lung in the field and it's up at the chest wall, then your lung is not collapsed by definition. So we'll show you some, some pictures of that. Um, when you have a pneumothorax, this interface is, is obliterated. Essentially, you, ha you will have the parietal pleural line, but you will not see the mo motion of the visceral at the parietal line. Okay, so again, you use your high frequency probe, you place it in a cranial caudal orientation, sagittal orientation, starting at the second inter intercostal space, use the midclavicular line. You wash through several modes of breathing, and you get this image in your picture, the pleural interface and the two ribs, and you see you're looking for the lung to slide back and forth as you breathe. And remember that the lung goes craniocaudal, so the best orientation to really catch it is when you're in the vertical orientation. So if the, remember that air impairs transmission of sound. So when the lung is up, you will see sometimes very faint B lines, you'll see A lines, um, but you won't see deep into the lung unless the lung is consolidated or something wrong with the lung. But you can see the pleural interface, you should be able to see that, you should be able to see sliding. However, if the lung has collapsed, that lung drops away, and you will not be able to get your ultrasound beam through that pocket of air to see anything underneath, including B lines. So even if the patient has pulmonary edema, you're not going to see it because there's air that's going to get in the way of your image. Everybody appreciate that, why it would be hard to see, and you wouldn't see the sliding. Okay, some examples. This patient is breathing. You can see a rib shadow on either side. You can see the pleural line, and you see some probably normal B lines, just very faint ones. But you can appreciate that there's movement at that, at that interface. Okay, rib shadow, ribs and rib shadows. And again, just in case we're not talking the same language, this is lung sliding and with some B lines underneath. This means that your lung is up. It's basically the visceral and parietal pleura are touching each other and you don't have a pneumothorax in that area where you're looking. Doesn't mean you don't have a pneumothorax somewhere else. You still have to be thorough and look in all the eight quadrants, but that means that the place where you're looking, the lung is, is adhered to the chest wall. Okay. Pneumothorax, however, this patient is breathing, not holding their breath. So you do see some movement of the chest wall because the patient's intercostal muscles are still contracting, but as far as the sliding, you don't see anything anymore. Sliding appears to a lot of people, it's been described as marching ants or shimmering. So what you're looking for is, it looks like little tiny ants are marching along that line or that there's a shimmery effect. And if you don't see that, then you have to be concerned that the lung is not touching the chest wall. And that you can also appreciate there's no comet tail there and there may even be the hint of an A-line there at the bottom of the screen. Moving on, just a couple examples. Is this lung sliding? So, pneumothorax or not? No. no. Good. You're experts now. <laughs> That's really all you need to know. 
How, how difficult is it to get that image? Very easy to get the image. You will all be flying through this and then looking at kidneys and hearts later today because it's very easy to get the image. The other, okay, so we're moving on to the, the end mode. So if you put an end mode line through that interface, through the plural line, and watch it over time, you end up having uh, an image that we call Sky Ocean Beach. You'll hear it also referred to as the seashore sign. Either way, the soft tissue creates a striped appearance. The plural line is bright white, and that's kind of like the, the, where the ocean meets the land. And if the lung is sliding underneath that plural line, you get a grainy effect due to the motion. You can't see the lung itself, but you can see the motion artifact. So basically that graininess is the beach, and that means the lung is moving, and it's in the picture. So that sky ocean beach is normal. If the lung has dropped, the beach disappears, because you just basically have stripes the whole way down, because all you're getting are reverberations from the soft tissue. You, don't, you can't see any lung, you can't see the motion of the lung, so the beach drops out of the picture and you have a barcode or stratosphere sign. Okay, some examples. This is an end mode through the plural interface with, uh, you, can, you can also appreciate, even though it hasn't gotten all the way across the screen, that you have a very diff definite um, sky, ocean, with the plural line being the, the horizon of the, where the ocean meets the land and a beach, more, more inferiorly. That's due to the motion of the, of the lung, okay? And by contrast, we have an upper picture where you can appreciate an A line, which tells you could be pneumothorax, could be normal, but then when you put an M mode through it, you have no beach. And this is a pneumothorax. So it looks like a barcode. So this is what we're looking for. In your models today, I'm sure nobody's gonna have a pneumothorax, but if you ask them to hold their breath very carefully, like when you're doing an M mode, get Sky Ocean Beach first, but then ask them to hold their breath and really you know, ask them not to move at all, and you'll, and you'll be able to see the stratosphere sign, the barcode. Because if the lung's not moving, you won't get that graininess. Sky Ocean Beach? Pneumothorax. Mm -hmm. Good job. Okay. Good job. Okay. Um, just another example of on the lower picture, a, a film with multiple A lines, and if, when you put the M mode through it, you have what definitely looks like a barcode, and the above picture where you can see the beach, the graininess of the beach due to the lung motion. And which one is positive? Right or left? Correct. It's very, yeah, it's very, once you understand what you're looking for and you can find that image, not a problem. And last example, which one is positive? Left. Nice job. Mm -hmm. So you can see how this, instead of wait, ordering a chest x-ray, waiting for the tech to come up, getting a film, waiting for someone to read it, 30 minutes later you get your answer, you can see how just putting a probe on the chest, you get your answer in 30 seconds, and you can really benefit the patient by knowing what's going on. So when it comes to uh, the different types of tissue that you can see with uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound, uh, in general, you know, we can certainly see those soft tissue, uh, uh, skin, subcutaneous areas. We see tendons, we can see muscle, we can see ligaments, uh, we can see down to the bony cortex. And we'll go through all these different uh, tissue, uh, tissue types as we, as we move along. So the first one we'll talk about is, is tendon, uh, tendon tissues and uh, kind of their characteristic uh, image quality and, and, and what you can see in terms of the tendons on ultrasound. Uh, this is a, a, a finger flexor tendon. This is the uh, middle phalanx through here, the lining of the, the bony cortex. This is the tendon overlying that, and this is the subcutaneous tissue. So very exquisite, very nice view of, of tendon tissue. So when we're looking specifically at this, there are certain characteristics of uh, of tendons that you're looking for. So it's a very kind of what we call fibular pattern. So it's uh, uh, the, you can see the fibrils of the tendon tissue kind of interspersed throughout that, that view. Uh, it's very hyperechoic, meaning it has a very strong, denser signal, not quite as much as bone, but, it's, it, but there is a dense uh, uh, hyperechoic image to, to tendons. 
as part of the limitations and knowing uh, what's normal, what's, what's not normal, there are some characteristics of certain tissues that you have to be aware of. And for tendons, there's something called uh, anisotropy or uh, anisotropy, depending on who you are and where you, where you uh, studied. Uh, but it's basically, you, when you're looking at tendons, it should have that very hyperechoic uh, view and that fibular pattern. When you're looking for problems in tendons, sometimes there's disruption of the tissue. It's black, it's dark, you can't quite see it. Uh, but that might be just in anisotropy as opposed to actual tear in the tendon. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and the other nice thing with tendons is, you know, it's again, it's real time, it's dynamic. So you can actually see the tendon move. You can see it move through the whole range of motion of that joint. And uh, you can see if there's any uh, um, disruption in anatomy, you know, at that point. So this is uh, anisotropy, just to talk a little bit about more about that. And we'll see that as we go through the practical scans uh, in, in this afternoon. But what you're, what you're looking at here is, uh, this is a bony cortex right here. This is the overlying tendon structure, this fibular longitudinal pattern through here uh, with the overlying subcutaneous tissue. Uh, now, what, what, uh, what the practitioner is doing right now is he's, he's bringing the probe from, from what we call heel to toe, so just rocking the probe. And as you do that, what you can see is look at this area here, it goes black, but then it comes back into view with uh, that fibular pattern, goes black, and then comes into view with the normal fibular pattern. So if you, if you paused it there, um, right at, at, at that moment where it's black, you would say, oh my gosh, there's a complete tendon tear, and there's, there's fluid there, but it's actually just anisotropy. And so you just little subtle adjustments, uh, you can see that there's normal tendon tissue there. And so you have to be careful when you're imaging tendons to, to, uh, to look for that when you see possible pathology to change, change positioning and make sure you're not just looking at the uh, anisotropy. Uh, and basically, it's, it has to do with how perpendicular the transducer is to the tendon. And if it's not complete perpendicular, then you're not going to get those sound waves coming back to the crystals. And so it's going gonna, it's gonna to come out as potential pathology. So again, when you're, when you're imaging the, uh, the tendons, it should be very nice, consistent, homogeneous tissue, fibular pattern, hyperechoic. And again, you can, you can see that tendon move through, through its whole range of motion as you flex and extend the joint space. Now, when we look at pathology with tendons and looking for, uh, you know, putting it in the clinical perspective of the patient and looking, is this tendonitis uh, or is this anywhere along the spectrum over to what we call tendinopathy, which is more chronic disorders in tendons. Uh, tendonitis is just that kind of acute process, inflammatory process, and uh, lots of inflammation uh, and swelling. And what, so what you're going to see on the ultrasound is just that fluid, that inflammation, that swelling around the tendon. Uh, as opposed to more tendinopathy or chronic tendon problems, it's going to be more thick tissue, a disruption in the actual uh, tendon uh, tissue and architecture. There's going to be a thickness. Uh, there's going to be changes in that echogenicity uh, in the tendon itself. And I mentioned earlier in terms of that power Doppler, with uh, tendinopathy or chronic tendon problems, there tends to be new vessel formation we call neovascularization in the tendon. So you put that power Doppler on, you can see some of that neovascularization that is uh, specific to that area of pathology as opposed to the rest of the tendon. Um, and then in general, you can see other changes like we, we, we hear about calcific tendonitis. We typically hear about that in the shoulder, rotator cuff muscles. And uh, just like bone, the, the calcific changes that you can see on this, this image here tend to be very thick uh, uh, hyperechoic structures. So these are calcific changes within the tendon architecture through here. And just like bone, you're going to get a lot of deep shadowing below that very hyperechoic thick tissue because the, the sound waves don't penetrate through. So you see nice, nice normal tendon tissue coming across and you see this calcific change. So a nice example of uh, some of the pathology that you can see. And then when it comes to actual tendon tears, uh, just like any other tissue in the body, muscle, uh, and, and other, other ligaments, you can have partial tears or complete tears. And what you're going to see on, on ultrasound kind of corresponds with that as well. You know, but basically looking for that discontinuity in the fibers, uh, tear within the fibers. Uh, when, when any tissue in the body tears, uh, it's going to bleed, so you're going to see that hematoma, local fluid collection. Uh, fluid basically is anechoic or, or basically no signal, it's black. And so you're going to see this uh, uh, anechoic area or black or fluid collection within uh, the tendon uh, architecture with uh, tearing in the tendon itself. And then Again, it's very dynamic, and so it, it's pretty neat. You can, you can then flex that tendon through its range of motion, and you actually see retraction of the tendon. Uh, 
and uh, instead of full no, nice uh, smooth movement. So you can actually see that tear functionally and uh, that can be very helpful to kind of evaluate how significant the tear is. And so this is a, this just an example of a partial tear. Uh, the, it's a little grainy, but this is the normal tendon fibular hyperechoic pattern through here. And then more superficial is this localized hematoma disruption in the tissue uh, um, architecture and, uh, and distension of the tissue with that localized hematoma. So that's that partial disruption with, with focal hemorrhaging. Uh, and then complete tear, basically you, what you can see on this, this image here is this is the, the uh, leading edge of the tendon, should be connecting to this part of the tendon, but there's obviously disruption there, retraction of the tendon, localized fluid collection, and uh, if you were to take that through range of motion, you would basically see that, that tendon stub basically retract, um, and you can see that dynamically. So that can be quite helpful. So we'll move on to muscle. Muscle is another thing that you can see very nicely with ultrasound, very superficial. Uh, just like tendons, muscles have a very uh, specific pattern in terms of imaging. A muscle tends to be a little bit more hypoechoic. It's not as thick, it's not as dense as say a tendon or a ligament. So you, it's more hypoechoic. It has also this kind of uh, fibular pattern, but it, it has to do with kind of the, the interwoven connective tissue within the muscle itself. You know, so on this image here, this is superficial subcutaneous structures. This is the, the uh, connective tissue kind of fascial plane for the muscle. Deep to that is this kind of fibular striated component of the muscle. Connective tissue coming into another fascial, player, uh, fascial layer here. And then deep to that, again, fibular kind of uh, striated aspects of, of the muscle, uh, deep muscle uh, structures. So again, it tends to be uh, more hypoechoic, but then you have that hyperechoic connective tissue fascial planes, and you can see that quite nicely on the, on the ultrasound. Uh, that was a longitudinal view. This is short axis view or transverse or axial view, different terms for that. Uh, again, more, more hypoechoic muscle structure. This is the deep bony structure here. Uh, so superficial that is the muscle, and these are these um, connective tissue dots uh, that in short axis view are referred to as kind of starry night pattern. Uh, you'll hear that um, term tossed around when looking at short axis view for muscle, as that, that starry night is just that interwoven connective tissue. So uh, uh, calf, calf muscle, uh, this is just a nice, nice view, longitudinal view of, uh, of a calf muscle, uh, connective tissue planes, uh, deeper uh, um, fibular pattern of the muscle, muscle here, connective tissue planes. Uh, real, real image di um, dynamic view moving across the uh, distribution of the muscle. This example of muscle rupture. So this is a, a complete rupture. Again, just like the tendon, you'll see the retraction or the stub of the actual muscle uh, tissue. So that should be connected to here. These are the fascial planes through here. This is uh, the muscle tissue back here and is retracted. Uh, partial tear, you're going to see um, uh, maintenance of those connective tissue fascial planes, but you're going to see that kind of intra-substance partial tearing uh, of the muscle. Again, just disruption of the uh, muscle tissue and maybe localized uh, hematoma. Uh, this is a patient I saw just a couple weeks ago, uh, calf or gastroc uh, tear with uh, a corresponding hematoma. So I'm just moving through the, the spectrum of the, of the hematoma through here, and uh, um, we'll replay that image. back through here. Okay. Uh, so as, as you move along here, you know, any fluid collection or hematoma is going to be compressible and you can use that dynamically to kind of aid in your analysis as well. But uh, what you'll see, and I'll have a later picture of this as we talk about some of the pathology, but you'll see actual disruption in the muscle tissue, retraction of the muscle fibers, and then what you'll see is this kind of corresponding hematoma uh, fluid collection. Uh, this is an image, uh, courtesy of Dr. Fox, uh, of, of a piece of glass that's in the gastroc muscle. So, you know, again, you can see the, the fibular pattern, the normal muscle tissue here, connective tissue layers, and then this uh, foreign body kind of jetting into the muscle tissue. Uh, and just like any other hyperechoic structure or reflective structure, you're going to see that posterior acoustic shadowing. Um, from that, from that uh, glass uh, foreign body. And so nice example of some of the pathology you can see um, on ultrasound. So moving to, to joints and, and uh, more bony anatomy now. Uh, 
Uh, so when we're looking at joint anatomy on ultrasound, it has this kind of characteristic seagull sign. So I, I showed this image earlier. So this is the, uh, the PIP joint, proximal interphalangeal joint, and it has this kind of joint space here, proximal joint, articular surface, uh, distal joint, articular surface, and this kind of seagull, seagull bird pattern. So that's just kind of a, uh, a typical thing you'll see at joint spaces and then distally, uh, again, joint space here uh, with distal articular surface here. The, uh, the, the ultrasound does have its limitations in terms of penetrating into the joint. Obviously, there's, there's bony uh, tissue surrounding that joint space, and so you're going to get that uh, shadowing deep to the, uh, to the uh, joint space, so there's going to be some limitations in terms of imaging. But you will be able to see the joint capsule, fluid that's in the joint, uh, fluid distension, and I'll show a couple images of that later. So as we run through, the, the normal, normal anatomy for, for bone and intact cortex, again, is that very thick hyperechoic line through here, this bony, bony architecture overlying uh, subcutaneous and muscle tissue. Uh, here is the, again, bony cortex through here, bony cortex through here. Um, and when you, when you get a good sense of what that looks like, and then you actually look at fractures of pathology, it becomes quite, quite obvious. Uh, where you have, again, that discontinuity and what people refer to as, as step-off when you're looking at fractures. Uh, it'd be nice if they were all this obvious. They're not always all that obvious uh, when you're looking at that top right picture. And then this, you know, distal uh, clavicle fracture, uh, you know, very, very common uh, step-off type appearance and displacement of the, of the bony, bony fragments. Uh, this is a comminuted uh, radius fracture. You'll see the, the continuity of the cortex line here. And then eventually you'll come into play here where you're shadowing step off to this cortex line here. And then as we move further along, you'll see another step off down to here. So there's basically two fracture lines, commuted multiple fracture locations. Again, seen very exquisitely with the, uh, with the ultrasound. Is it really painful to ultrasound Not so much. And you actually use the site of a maximal tenderness to, as a guide to where to image on the bone as kind of your protocol to find it. Uh, there's, there's different tissues that, uh, that when you're trying to image, you do have to, or different regions of the body, you do have to put a little pressure. Uh, but most of the time, with, uh, especially with these uh, forearm bones or, or bones that you're typically gonna image for uh, fracture uh, visualization, you don't really have to push that hard. You just place the probe um, on, the, on, the, uh, on the surface of the skin. And, uh, and there typically tends to be a lot of fluid collection, you know, and hematomas in association with fractures. And as we know, uh, water and fluid uh, helps the penetration of the, uh, of the sound waves. And so it, it, the hematoma actually helps a little visualization of the, of the actual fracture. So you don't have to push that hard. And so you, you do find that maximal point of tenderness and then visualize there. Also, um, sorry if I can interrupt. Sure. Um, with fractures, as long as the bones are not moving around, there's, a, there's usually not that much pain associated with the fracture. I mean, I had a guy a couple nights ago who was, he had both bone fractures, forearm, and his arm was so angulated, and he, he was just kind of sitting around looking around the room, pretty calm, and everybody kept looking at him like, wow, that looks like it really hurts, but it's when you start to move the bones around, that's where the true pain is. So when you're doing an ultrasound, you put so much gel on it. In fact, you, you can get gel out of the refrigerator. I always keep a bottle in the refrigerator, and so you can put some chilled gel on there, and then you don't even touch the skin. The ultrasound touches the gel, and then it's actually... Um, painless to do an ultrasound for, for a fracture. As long as you're not moving the bone. Once you start moving the bones around, then the patient lets you know about it. <laughs> for sure. All right, so and then uh, a couple a couple of views, a couple more views of uh, uh, bony discontinuity here. Uh, and then as it relates to um, actual clinical application and reducing fractures, you can see that very well uh, on ultrasound. So this is where the patient would be painful, uh, but hopefully at this point you've done a hematoma block and uh, local anesthesia for the, for the area of the fracture. And then you can see quite nicely as you're moving that fracture location and reducing it, uh, you can see good mobility and visualization of that. And then you can then follow that up with an ultrasound image uh, that shows good uh, post-reduction in anatomical alignment. And if you've ever done this clinically just by traditional methods, it can be quite, quite cumbersome because you, you get the x-ray, you show the fracture, uh, then you have to kind of have the x-ray up. You're looking at the x-ray. You're trying to visualize the fracture, and you're moving it in what direction you feel is appropriate and by protocol. Then you have to splint it, and then you send them back to x-ray. Then they get another x-ray, and then they come back. You look at it, or you're like, oh, shoot, we're a little bit off. Got to realign it. 
and then get up good and then splint them and send them back to x-ray and it's this this cumbersome process whereas you put the ultrasound machine on there you're watching it anatomic alignment splint it and we're all good you know and so it can be be quite useful and uh and to the patient's uh, benefit so now we kind of have a sense of what tendons are supposed to look like uh bones are supposed to look like muscle and we've seen a little bit of the pathology. We'll kind of jump into a couple uh, specific anatomical reg uh, regions and get a sense for what you can actually use in a clinical setting. And like in my practice, sports medicine practice, what we can see, what certain diagnoses uh, we might be able to use this for, and uh, what they look like on ultrasound, just so you guys could get a sense of that. Uh, hand, wrist, and finger is an area that's used a lot, mostly because, again, it's very superficial. You can see a lot of uh, great anatomy. And in particular, for you know, some common uh, uh, diagnoses that we use it for, ganglion cysts, a common complaint uh, for, for wrist and hand in, in a, in a uh, clinic visit. Uh, ligamentous disruption, so specific for the hand, you have that ulnar collateral ligament on the, uh, on the thumb, the ulnar aspect of the thumb, um, MCP joint. It can be uh, very easily visualized, and again, that's, that's one area where we use that dynamic imaging. It can be very, very useful for a diagnosis, uh, tendon injuries, whether it's your extensor or flexor tendons, uh, decor veins, tenosynovitis, a very, very common complaint in the clinic. Again, can be uh, very easily uh, visualized. I'll show some images of that. And then carpal tunnel uh, is, is, uh, is an area that ultrasound is being used for a lot, not only for uh, imaging, but, but uh, ultrasound guidance for injections of the carpal tunnel. So this is decor veins. Uh, some of these images are a little bit old from, from my fellowship training. But uh, what, what you're looking at here is, uh, so this is the deep uh, bony, bony cortex through here, uh, joint space here. This is the overlying uh, tendon uh, tissue here, the extensor pollicis brevis, which is part of that decor veins complex you guys will learn about more in the, in the coming years. But there's, uh, uh, the EPB is the, uh, one of the tendons involved in decor veins. You can see it very nicely, very superficial. And as I mentioned earlier with uh, tendonitis, you tend to see fluid and collection of that inflammation. And so you're gonna see uh, fluid surrounding, surrounding the tendon. So what, what you have here is, is, is a short axis or axial view of the tendon. Uh, this is that, that little dot of the tendon running lengthwise as you're looking down the tendon. And then what you'll see is this uh, anechoic or fluid collection around the tendon as kind of a halo around the tendon or, or target sign we also refer to as a target sign. And so that's basically fluid that's in the tendon sheath. So that's your tenosynovitis. And uh, you can see that very, very nicely uh, on the ultrasound. And then um, this is an ideal uh, depiction, but uh, basically you're, you're imaging the tendon, you can see the tendon sheath, and then you can see your needle slip into that tendon sheath and see infiltration uh, of the fluid around the tendon itself. Uh, also nice to uh, ensure that you're not actually in the tendon. So intratendinous injections are contraindicated, especially if you're talking about cor cortisone. Uh, certain modalities you're actually trying to, uh, to target the tendon itself, but in general, you're trying to get that, that medicine around the tendon, but not actually in the tendon. And you can see that quite nicely when you're using ultrasound guidance. It can be quite helpful. Uh, so around the elbow, a couple you know, very common diagnoses, whether it's tennis elbow or, or golfer's elbow, lateral epicondylitis or medial epicondylitis, uh, there's multiple names for it, but uh, you, can, you can image those areas uh, quite well. So this is the distal humerus. Uh, humeral radial joint or capitellar radial joint radial head and this is the extensor tendon coming in and attaching on the humerus uh, lateral epicondyle here so superficial deep bone structure tendon tissue coming across the joint space and attaching on the lateral epicondyle so that the tinnitus elbow is really a tendon disorder and so the epicondylitis uh, is a little bit of a misnomer but what you're dealing mostly with is tendon uh, pathology or tendon abnormalities and so on tennis elbow, a lot of times you can visualize that tendon quite nicely. And this tendon has this uh, fluid collection here, disruption of normal tendon fibular pattern. It's a little bit thicker. So this is a, a tendinopathy or probably a chronic tennis elbow. And you can see that quite nicely here. And again, you can direct uh, injection treatments um, in other modalities, new modalities like platelet-rich plasma and some of these things you guys have probably heard about. Uh, and you can use the ultrasound guidance very well for that. Again, ligamentous disruption, ulnar collateral ligament on the inside of the elbow. Uh, again, this is one area, like in our baseball pictures, we wanna know how much laxity is there. And you can see that real-time dynamic imaging as that joint space is opening up and flexing open. You can see that on ultrasound. Uh, as well as uh, since uh, 
you can image the joints very well. You can see joint effusions and joint coll uh, fluid collections. So around the shoulder, uh, this is an area that has been studied a lot because this is uh, one area that is, is very common uh, diagnosis and clinical complaint, you know, shoulder pain, shoulder impingement, rotator cuff tendonitis, a big reason why patients come into the clinic and a big reason why we order a lot of MRIs. And so people are trying to find out, can we use ultrasound in the office, avoid MRIs, avoid healthcare costs, and is it a reliable modality to diagnose these rotator cuff tears or rotator cuff tendinopathies? And what we're finding with the literature is that it is very accurate and very reliable. And uh, with sensitivity and specificity numbers that are, are quite remarkable in some cases, a very, very, very uh, reliable modality. Um, a little bit more reliable for full, thic full thickness versus partial thickness tears. Again, the, the pathology is going to be very much more obvious when there's a full full tear as opposed to partial tears. But, but either way, very accurate. And as you guys go through your training, you'll kind of get a sense for kind of good and bad sensitivities and specificities. And these are, these are quite good numbers when you're looking at reliability. Um, also around the shoulder, you can see biceps tendinopathy. We can look a little bit about at that uh, when we go through the uh, practical uh, portion, as well as AC joint arthropathy. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is biceps tendon. This is kind of a short axis long view of, of uh, I'm sorry, short axis view of the long head of the biceps tendon as it comes up through that bicipital groove in the shoulder. So this is the, uh, this is the humerus. Um, and uh, this is the bicipital groove between those humeral condyles. And the biceps tendon sits right in this little groove here. And it's a very easy thing to image, and we'll, we'll show you guys that during the practical component. But it's a, it's a very, very easy way to identify that biceps tendon. Uh, and you can see uh, uh, if there's any pathology in the biceps tendon. You can see if there's that target sign. So this is what I was talking about earlier. So this is the biceps tendon in the middle, surrounding fluid, and then you have the overlying um, uh, subscapularis tendon and underlying uh, humeral cortex. So you see this uh, kind of target sign or tenus synovitis or fluid collection around the tendon. You see that quite nicely um, on, on these uh, um, bicep uh, imaging. And this is just the humeral head going into external internal rotation. And as it comes into external rotation, you can see the subscapularis coming across the top. So very easily imaged uh, rotator cuff tendons on, on this modality. And you can see, that, uh, see it quite well. So AC joint is kind of interesting one when it comes to ultrasound because it seems like a very superficial joint, very easy thing to inject, but it's also very, very small. And sometimes uh, body habitus doesn't allow you to locate it quite well. And if you remember one of those studies in the literature review I showed uh, was one study looking at AC joint injections and the failure rate was, was uh, pretty high. And so you're trying to get this little 25 gauge needle into this really tiny joint, usually doing it in the setting of joint arthritis or calcific changes, that's what you see here. So this is the AC joint. Uh, this is uh, uh, clavicle, this is the chromium process, this is the AC joint, uh, joint space. Uh, this is uh, part of the joint fluid, calcific changes. And if you're trying to get in, not only to a small joint, but there's a bunch of calcium and bony spurs around it, it can be kind of hard. But you put, that, you put that ultrasound probe right on top of the shoulder, you see exactly where that joint is, and then boom, you, you, can, you can head right at it. Uh, and, it, and it's a uh, quite easy injection to do with uh, ultrasound guidance as opposed to without. The uh, hip and groin is another area where ultrasound is uh, being used more and more, especially in the uh, sports arena for either intraarticular injections, uh, you know, again, avoiding uh, uh, fluoroscopy and radiation exposure. The uh, more superficial diagnoses, uh, trochanteric bursitis, which is one of the most common hip complaints that I see in the clinic. A uh, very easy injection to do under ultrasound guidance. You see exactly where you're going, very superficial structures, uh, as well as muscle injury. You know, so here's uh, uh, adductor muscle tear and uh, adductor associated uh, adductor tendon. Uh, so you see this uh, collection of hematoma, uh, tissue disruption, uh, and um, retraction of, of tissue uh, in the area of tear. And in, in the, the, the groin and the hip is an area where MRI is, is uh, traditionally less reliable and it's very hard to image some of these subtle uh, muscle weaknesses or muscle fascial herniations. And there's things like sports hernia, which is this very uh, nebulous topic where you could have pathology involving either uh, hernia structures or muscle tears or uh, tendon tears and a lot of different things that can happen in sports hernia that very traditionally is not imaged on MRI, but we see very well with ultrasound. And uh, these are some of the uh, muscle tissues that sometimes can be involved in uh, sports hernia that you can see quite well 
uh, with uh, ultrasound. Uh, another very common source of pain in the groin uh, in athletes particularly is a uh, um, osteitis pubis or just kind of chronic changes at the pubic, uh, pubic symphysis, inflammation. And the best way to, to kind of work through your differential on that is to inject it. And it's obviously a sensitive area to inject that you kind of want to have image guidance to inject. And you can see it quite well on ultrasound and use ultrasound guidance for those injections. Uh, and then lower extremity, a uh, whole laundry list. This isn't even all of them of things that you can use ultrasound for with the lower extremity, whether it's uh, your tendinopathies, again, patellar, patellar tendinitis or patellar tendinopathy, Achilles tendinitis or tendinopathy are, are very, very common diagnoses uh, for patients coming into the clinic, especially in sports. And you can see uh, a, a, these tendon structures very well. This is patella tendon. Uh, so this is the uh, inferior pole of the patella coming down through patellar tendon and then patellar tendon attaching on the proximal tibia or the tibial tubercle. So uh, very, very well imaged. This is that retropatellar area where you have the fat pad and a bursa and uh, you can see the, the anatomy quite well. You can see LCL quite well. You can see MCL quite well. You can't see ACL, PCL. Again, you know, limitations of your modality and knowing what you can use it for. But you can see it for meniscus. And then around the ankle, you can visualize that those peroneal groups, uh, ATFL, anterior talofibular ligament, you know, all the, all the common ligament to the structures that you see in, in, your, in your common ankle sprains. Uh, all these bristle sacs tend to be very superficial. You can image those quite well. And uh, again, those muscle tears, muscle strains, full ruptures, hamstring, very, very common injury in sports, hamstring tears. You can see that quite well on, uh, on ultrasound. So ligamentous injuries, uh, this is a kind of a depiction of a normal MCL. So this is joint space here, femur, tibia, and uh, MCL. MCL. Ligaments look very similar as tendons. You have that fibular pattern, but it's a little bit more hyperchoic, a little bit more dense uh, than, than tendons. So this is this dense ligamentous structure coming across here. Uh, this is uh, proximal. Uh, femoral uh, condyle MCL coming distally. And this is an example of MCL tear. So this is a distal MCL tear. So this is the joint space here, MCL coming across, and then you see disruption the, of the tissue here. And then distally, you see no longer any ligamentous um, tissue. So it's basically retracted proximally. So very well seen on, on uh, ultrasound. I mentioned earlier that you can see some meniscus pathology. So this is uh, the joint space here, femur and tibia. Uh, this is the joint capsule or fusion. Again, you can see distension of the, of the intraarticular fluid, uh, joint swelling. And this is the meniscus that's basically displaced. It has meniscal cysts in here. So you can see a lot of meniscus pathology uh, on ultrasound. But there certainly are zones of the meniscus that are deeper that you can't quite image, and in, in which case you have to rely on your MRI to uh, image those areas. Uh, this is an example, a patient I saw a couple weeks ago, joint effusion, just kind of classic uh, presentation of knee arthritis, acute exacerbation, lots of pain, lots of swelling in the knee. This is that uh, suprapatellar pouch of the joint space. So uh, the knee joint space extends pretty far above the knee on that suprapatellar pouch. And when you have a joint effusion, that area can be extended uh, or distended. And this is the fluid collection in there. So all fluid with uh, some joint debris uh, floating around. You know, this is just a chronic kind of classic osteoarthritis presentation seen quite well, long axis view, axial view. This is the femur right here, hyperchoic line. Incredibly common, I see this all the time in the department. Yeah. yeah, and what's nice is you know, when you're doing then, uh, you're either aspirating, you know, not all of them are, are, are straightforward. You know, is this infection, is this gout, is this just arthritis? Uh, is this uh, acute hematoma? You know, a lot of different things that can cause a joint effusion. So if you need to aspirate that fluid, uh, very easily identified, you know, okay, that's where the suprapatellar pouch is. There's the swelling. Stick the needle right there, and you're, and you're right on it. And so very easily visualized and uh, very applicable to a clinical setting. So this is that, that calf hematoma I showed earlier, the hematoma formation. Uh, this is the retraction of that, of that calf muscle. So this is the same patient here. Uh, with retraction of muscle tissue, muscle tear. Uh, and this is contiguous with this hematoma formation here. Um, this is another uh, high school athlete of mine. So, so great, great uh, example of accessibility of this ultrasound modality and, and as it becomes more portable. So when I go see kids in the high schools in the training rooms uh, where we don't have x-rays in the high school or MRIs in the high school, and a lot of these kids don't have even insurance, 
aren't plugged into the system, sometimes it's really frustrating and difficult for me to get an x-ray for a kid or get an MRI for a kid, but I have the, I can take that ultrasound machine in the training room and then slap it right on the, on the kid's hamstring and, and boom, we got the hamstring tear. Uh, very well visualized, you can see the extent of it, how big is it, how big is the hematoma, how fast, how aggressive can we be with this kid. And uh, I don't have to worry about um, him getting uh, secondary imaging and going through all the hassles with that and expense to the family, et cetera. So this is one of my high school athletes just a few weeks ago with a acute hamstring tear. This is a patient I saw on Tuesday, comes in six months of uh, Achilles pain, heel pain, a runner, and is, is basically uh, at wit's end because he can't get back to his training, lots of pain. And uh, what we're showing here is basically the, uh, the distal Achilles tendon coming down to calcaneal insertion here. Uh, so the earlier movie was just basically showing the continuity of the tendon, very healthy tendon. Uh, this is a short axis view of the tendon here, calcaneus hypercoque line here. And what you can see is the, the calcaneal insertion, uh, Achilles tendon coming down here and you're getting disruption of normal architecture. This was not in an isotropy. Uh, as, as I you know, move the probe around, that discrepancy stays there. That's a flu localized fluid collection disruption of the insertion. And insertion of Achilles tendinopathy is a very common diagnosis and very easily uh, visualized on, on ultrasound. Uh, this was a baseball player a couple weeks ago, got hit in the shin with baseball, kind of classic uh, uh, tibial contusion. Um, not necessarily something you would typically image clinically, but just a very a good example of what you can see on ultrasound, so I imaged it. And what you see here is short axis view of the tibia, uh, long axis view of the, of the tibia through here. And you can see the uh, superficial subcutaneous uh, uh, collection of fluid from the hematoma from tissue disruption, hematoma here. And here you can actually see a little bit of uh, tissue debris. Sometimes with these hematomas you get thickening of the tissue uh, and a collection of tissue debris, uh, which can sometimes cause other complications which you could follow on ultrasound uh, that you might not necessarily see on, on x-ray or other imaging modalities.